Have you ever dreamed of a donut? I have. Now, in my defense, to call it a donut is a bit unfair. I was in Rome, and I knew that the next morning I would be tearing into a maritosi con panna, a cream-filled yeast roll breakfast confection from the heavens. I barely slept that night, but when I did, I dreamed of that donut. That was a food craving, which is different from hunger. Hunger is when the belly lets you know that it needs a fill-up, or sometimes what we think of as hunger is just the clock on the wall telling us it's time for a -a thrice-a-day feeding. Cravings are different. From America's Test Kitchen, I'm Bridget Lancaster, and this is Proof. Some cravings make sense, or at least they're a little stereotypical. I remember this famous bit from I Love Lucy. Ricky has to procure some very strange foods for his very pregnant wife. Oh, honey, where have you been? What took you so long? What do you mean, what took me so long? I had to go all over town. Hi, did you get everything? Yeah, I got everything. But if you don't stop having these silly cravings at 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to freeze to death. (laughs) Other cravings might be triggered by a memory. Think about Grandma and that special treat she used to make. You can almost taste it right now, can't you? Then there are the cravings that are seemingly inexplicable, as if someone or something has taken over your body. That craving slides into your shoes or it puts its hands on the wheel it drives you to eat something you didn't even know you wanted just moments before. A few weeks ago, I was leaving work, packing up my things, and just about to head out of the office when, seriously, the most random craving hit me like a truck. This is reporter Jacqueline Kim. It was for churros. Like, I needed churros. But the weird thing, they had to be El Pollo Loco churros, which aren't even the best churros out there. El Pollo Loco, the fast food habit worth having. I mean, they're pretty good, but um, I, I kid you not, I drove 20 minutes out of my way through traffic to find the nearest El Pollo Loco. And mind you, this location didn't have a drive through either, so it required parking in a tiny crowded lot and actually walking into the place with my two feet just to get my stomach to calm down. And that day, I hadn't seen any advertisements of churros. I hadn't smelled anything similar to churros, and no one in the office was talking about them. So it was just strange how strong and specific this craving was. Jacqueline's a self-admitted slave to her food cravings. They rule her life. In fact, they may have even gotten in the way of a few friendships. Uh, Some of them have learned to embrace it because being a strong craver, I think you build really good intel on great places to eat so they can appreciate that part. But I do specifically remember a few months ago, a bunch of my friends, we were going to go out and get Korean barbecue. And I was just not in the mood. I was craving soup that day. So one of my friends actually like blew up at me in the parking lot. (laughs) And she was like, why can't you just eat with us? I was like, well, you know, we eat that all the time. I don't. I, I just really am in the mood for soup. Like, I need soup right now. Right. <laughs> um, and luckily, I did convince one of my friends on the other side to come with me so I didn't go alone. <laughs> and then my other friends are just shaking their heads. But they, it's, it's kind of like an inside joke. It has been a hot summer in California this year. And sure, us Californians always complain about the weather whenever it's not perfect. But with the AC broken at my house and having to endure through weeks of record-breaking temperatures, I've been on a kick for my love of Korean cold noodles. I'm not just hungry for cold noodles, though. 
I've been craving this very specific dish from a very specific restaurant, and I finally found time to sit down and satisfy that craving. If you've ever heard of naengmyeon, a popular type of Korean cold noodle, this isn't it. Instead, in front of me is a chilled bowl of makguksu at a small Buena Park restaurant called Hudurug. Fun names, right? Anyway, it's sort of like a hybrid of naengmyeon and the Japanese buckwheat soba noodles. The most important thing to know, it's absolutely delicious. Oh my, it's so good. Each bite is a refreshing burst of flavor, a perfect balance of spices, garlic, sweet pickled toppings, and sesame oil that ever so lightly drizzles down the noodles like liquid gold. Oh, okay, that sounds so good. I'm craving a bowl of makguksu right now, I think. <laughs> it really is delicious, and I'm probably being over-affectionate about this dish, but I, I do wonder, is it just my love of makguksu that makes satisfying this craving so worthwhile? Uh, is it simply cultural, or maybe it really is the unbearable heat wave? But this whole intense craving for something isn't an anomaly for me. I get really strong cravings for really specific foods at least once a week, if not every other day. Is that normal? Why do we humans crave in the first place? And can science even answer this? I don't think we really know. And part of the reason why is there's probably a lot of different sources. That's John Allen, anthropologist and research associate at Indiana University Bloomington. He studies the evolution and biocultural basis of human eating behaviors and has found that our eating habits are influenced by all sorts of things. In a way, that's a good thing because that's what leads us to be omnivorous. We can adjust ourselves to different sort of diets and environments. And yet, underlying that, people will still develop these cravings. One highly developed craving, for example, coffee. Oh, I can anecdotally confirm that coffee cravings are, in fact, biological. I'm guessing you're a big coffee drinker, but not necessarily. Sometimes people would think, oh, we're going to crave those things that uh, we have some sort of evolutionary basis for, some general desire, like a, a salt craving. That really can be quite physiological that we share across a lot of different mammals. But coffee is something that we learn to consume but really is something that, in our evolutionary past, we're not really meant to consume at all. For one, coffee is bitter, which John says is usually a signal to the body to spit it out. And two, it requires some kind of vessel for boiling liquid, a feat only modern humans have utilized. Okay, now, wait a minute. We, well, maybe we weren't meant to consume coffee, but I know that certain people depend on it. I'm talking about myself here. I mean, I count how much coffee I've had in the day, not by cups, but by pots. I've got a real problem, and I know it. There's Sometimes there's a part of the day where I get afraid that I can't get to coffee. You know, if at home we get to the bottom of the bag of beans, I see that we have a couple of tablespoons left, I actually start to have a real reaction. There's kind of a fear that sets in that I'm going to run out. Well, I actually don't understand uh, the addiction to coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker, but I'm surrounded by coffee drinkers. And uh, really, that I, I think that addiction, that anxiety, comes from one key ingredient in coffee. Well, it has this psychoactive substance called caffeine in it. And that helps make you crave it. I actually think part of craving it in the morning is probably dehydration is that people wake up and they're thirsty, and they, rather than drinking water, the first thing they've learned to drink or to have as a liquid is coffee. So you have that sort of, I need some liquid, and I need this button push that I've made myself require in the morning would be a caffeine. And therefore, you crave coffee. So that's just, and I mean, the, the biology underlying it is ancient, but that substance is really foreign to our quote-unquote natural diet. Kind of sounds like a self-inflicted craving then, rather than a completely random urge for El Pollo Loco churros or Korean cold noodles. But there's still a lot of questions here. Like, what separates general hunger and a person's affinity for certain foods versus that soul-crushing demand from your stomach to eat this now? 
I asked Julia Holmes, an associate professor at SUNY Albany in New York. She studies the psychology of human food choice. That's actually always one of the first things I start with is definitions, because I think there's a lot of confusion about what we actually mean when we say craving. So hunger is really mostly for any food. You might have you know, an idea of what you want to eat, sometimes based on time of day, breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Craving tends to be incredibly specific, so specific that we sometimes have people who report not just craving chocolate, but a particular brand and kind of chocolate. Hold on now. We need to talk about chocolate just a little bit more. And, you know, I could really go for a piece of chocolate right now. Yes, I could too. Actually, I could go for those dark chocolate peanut butter cups from Trader Joe's. Have you ever tried those? Oh, yeah. (laughs) So the specificity is one of the things that separates craving from hunger. And then the other thing is that often cravings occur regardless of how long it's been since we've last eaten. Um, So it can really be at any time and it's not necessarily related to how full we are. That pretty much sums up my cravings, specific and random. But yes, there's an important conversation to be had about chocolate. Actually, where a lot of the literature started, interestingly enough, is with chocolate craving. Um, Chocolate is the most commonly craved food in the United States. Almost every woman in the U.S., about two-thirds of men, say that they've ever craved chocolate, so it's incredibly common. And ladies, unless you're a non-fan of chocolate— you've probably lost yourself in a giant bowl of chocolate ice cream during that ungodly time of the month. And so that kind of informed some of the early hypotheses about what causes these cravings. So people immediately said, you know, it must be hormones. Um, And then the other sort of, you know, comparable hypotheses, comparable in the sense that they're also focused on these more what I call physiological or biological explanations, tend to point to the ingredients in chocolate. Well, you know, I have read that chocolate is a dopamine-releasing food. So usually foods that are high in fat, sugar, or carbs release dopamine in our brains. And some scientists say that women like to eat these types of food during menstruation. Well, Julia definitely emphasized the complexity of the ingredients in chocolate, which include cannabinoids and substances similar to caffeine. Uh, Some researchers even believe that women tend to crave chocolate during menstruation because it satisfies sort of a nutritional need or deficiency, while others think it's more pharmacological and we crave it because it provides an energy boost. But the long story short, and this is never popular news for people, there really is no good evidence to support any of these hypotheses. The big piece sort of where I came in, where I became really interested is there's a lot of really interesting cultural differences in craving and that menstrual chocolate craving seems to be a very Western slash North American slash U.S. phenomenon. It's rarely reported in other countries. Um, You know, women in Egypt were surveyed and I think only about four or five percent reported craving any sweets. Only about 28%, I think, of women in Spain report menstrual chocolate craving, you know, compared to a lot more, about 50% of women here. So if we assume that biologically we're all the same (laughs) and function the same way, regardless of where we live, there has to be something else going on um, that doesn't have to do with biology. After the break, pork feet and smelly water. Before the break, Julia Horms took us through famous studies on menstrual chocolate cravings and suggested that there might be more to those cravings than just biological needs. Here's Jacqueline again to unpack another possibility. Cravings might be a phenomenon of thought processes, according to Julia's alternative research, how we think about food. From the time a thought of a craving is sparked, whether by some internal or external trigger, to how we strengthen and act upon those cravings. But there seems to be more on this topic of gender differences as well. What about pregnant women and their notoriously random cravings? Here's Nicole Avina, neuroscientist and author of the book, What to Eat When You're Pregnant. Cravings during pregnancy often are for the same reasons why we have cravings when people aren't pregnant. And so a lot of the cravings during pregnancy can be environmentally driven. But we also have that added layer of 
the fact that we have hormonal fluctuations happening in pregnant women that don't happen in non-pregnant women and that don't happen in men. Nicole explains that with a baby on board, it's common for mothers to assume that their cravings are a signal of the body or baby wanting something specific. But her research really points back to the hormonal fluctuations, exacerbating what would otherwise be pretty normal cravings. This got me really curious. Mom, when you were pregnant with me, what did you crave the most? Pork feet. The Korean steamed pork feet? Yeah. And then I dip it with a little salt and sesame seed and almost like I eat all day long. Do you know why? I don't know. I was craving that all the time when I was pregnant. So I probably eat 10 months through the, you know, pregnancy. <laughs> what about when you were pregnant with, with Sean? Sean's my older brother. That too. Both of you, I love those jokbal. And I can drink water, so I drink lots of milk. You, can, you couldn't drink water? Some of the water smells really bad when I was pregnant. Now, I have no idea how I would have gotten through either of my pregnancies without gallons and gallons of water. I was like a fish. And I didn't really have any aversions, but I had plenty of cravings. I mean, one of them is not that crazy. It was coffee, ice cream, specifically milkshakes. I sent my husband out at 10 o'clock at night to go find a place that had coffee milkshakes. But I think the craziest thing might have been sauerkraut. I couldn't get enough. I was eating it right out of the bag. Something about that pickly flavor and the soft, shreddy texture. But it's just kind of amazing. <laughs> well, on that thought, here's Nicole Avina again. It's not only just cravings for certain tastes, but cravings for certain smells or aversions for certain smells. Our smell and our taste are very closely linked. And so, you know, certain types of odors can actually make people feel nauseous, and especially during pregnancy. And some prego cravings are just plain bizarre. I had one interesting, uh, in the book I mentioned this, that a friend of mine um, who was pregnant, she craved the smell of cut wood, and she would go to Home Depot and just walk around and sniff. <laughs> it was her pregnancy craving, and she was just happy it wasn't, you know, ice cream instead. <laughs> I also asked Nicole if we know whether or not there's a genetic component to how often and how strongly we crave things. So there's a fair amount of research that suggests that sugar craving or a sweet tooth has a hereditary component, and that's actually been linked to alcoholism. And so there's been you know several studies that have been done over the years that have looked at you know whether or not a person had a sweet tooth or their parent had what they identify as a sweet tooth, and the occurrence of alcoholism in the family. And there seems to be a relationship between those two. So. Again, I think that there certainly is the potential for this hereditary component for cravings, but it becomes so difficult. And especially now because, you know, we live in a food environment where the foods are constantly changing. Meaning our diets are no longer as simple as they used to be, at least in the U.S. We're constantly bombarded by endless options for just one food item. Talk about first world problems. Well, exactly. I mean, you go to the grocery store, there is no shortage of choice. Yeah, and there's also this question of proximity, I think. Do we crave what we crave if we know it's accessible? If it's not accessible, then it's just a fantasy, right? Anthropologist John Allen. I wish, I wish I, I really want to have, you know, uh, chocolate mousse I had in the south of France and Avignon, which I still think about. I did. It was, I had a chocolate mousse 30 years ago, whatever it was. The best part was it was just served. They said, oh, you want dessert? And they just brought the terrine out. And I could still taste it. And it was like, oh, well, that was good. And I remember, but I don't, I might want to have chocolate, but I can't crave that because that would just be disappointing, wouldn't it? Uh, Jackie? Mm. Uh, Jackie. Oh, so sorry, Bridget. It's getting really late here, and my stomach has been screaming for fried chicken for the last hour. Well, now I want fried chicken. I mean, everything you say, I start to crave. What's going on there? Now is fried chicken. That's all I can think about. 
Okay, so we've covered a lot up to this point. Let me recap. There's the physiological, the biological, the psychological components of cravings. And then there's differences in gender, maybe some hereditary components. And then, of course, we had John's chocolate mousse in the south of France, which now I am also craving. (laughs) Yes. But now that my brain and, more importantly, stomach have gotten some fuel, time to do a little more research. My name is Nicholas Scornel Grotto. Uh, I'm a student at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Uh, I've been working in this lab for a couple of years now, and we've just published a paper on information-seeking behaviors relating specifically to food. I found Nicholas's co-authored paper in the Journal of Royal Society Open Sciences. And basically, they took this massive amount of data available on Google Trends about how and when people search for food online. Something I definitely spend way too much of my time doing. Thank God that chicken place was open till 2 a.m. What we noticed was there seemed a very distinct, robust pattern at the time of day that people searched certain key terms relating to food. We start off with very general terms and specified it down according to certain protocols. We carried out the study in five different countries. The UK, the US, Australia, and Canada to begin with, uh, and then included India at a later date. Nicholas and his colleague paid particularly close attention to searches for late-night pizza and Chinese food deliveries. The main thing that we found about this study was this double peak, as we like to call it, in the evening, uh, which is the thing what people are most surprised about. It's the fact that in every country that we looked at, with every search term that we used, we found this double peak occurring at 7 o'clock at night and 2 o'clock in the morning. So our hypothesis is that this kind of information-seeking pattern is driven by some kind of biological mechanism. What that mechanism is, we don't know yet, but the fact that it's so robust across so many different countries, we think it's more biologically driven versus culturally driven. Well, Jackie, it sounds like you're not alone in your late night fried chicken cravings. I'm not sure that's good news, but yes, I'm I'm not alone. Back in 2017, there was a story about a peanut butter and jelly sandwich that broke the internet. Actually, so many PB&J sandwiches. That's because NBA players are addicted to them, and these sandwiches fill their locker rooms. I got a chance to catch up with Baxter Holmes, national NBA writer for ESPN who wrote the piece, and later won a James Beard Award for it. We met at his home in downtown L.A., when I first read your piece on the NBA's secret addiction to PB&J, my first thought was like, this has got to be the longest article ever written about a sandwich. <laughs> but it's obviously so much more than that, too. Um, and, and for listeners who haven't had a chance to read it yet, I, I don't want to spoil everything. But if you can kind of just give us a sense of how widespread the PB&J addiction really is in the NBA. Sure. I don't, well, first of all, I'll say, I don't know if I've been in an NBA locker room where I haven't seen it. There's a lot of foods that will vary in terms of like the pregame or postgame spreads um, that teams will prepare uh, for catered meals. But I, I mean, you can almost set your watch by always seeing a loaf of bread, you know, and jars of peanut butter and jelly. And then some of the teams, you know, as I'd written in the piece, get really elaborate with having, um, I think the Bucks at one point, I'm not sure if they still do, but or the Milwaukee Bucks had like a, a buffet of different, you know, nut butters and jams and jellies and marmalades and Nutella and different kinds of bread. And it can be really particular in terms of crust or no crust, toasted, grilled, um, what kind of jams and jellies and everything is kind of accommodated back to the stars. But the thing I would say is like, you know, this is a, this is a childhood kind of sandwich that we associate with like grade school lunches and so forth, you know, that our parents made. And yet these are millionaire athletes in a league <laughs> where there's so much sports science, there's so much sports nutrition, so many dietitians, so many personal chefs, so many really well-achieved chefs who work for these teams. And yet if you go into a locker room, you're going to see like this, you're going to see this sandwich time and again everywhere you turn. Your piece also went into a little bit of evolution, Mm -hmm. anthropology, and how the brain tends to develop cravings. Can you talk more about that? So this was one of the most surprising elements um, to me was that there's a lot of elements in uh, peanut butter and jelly that are kind of, they satisfy certain cravings that date back basically to survival, you know, a long time ago. So, you know, the fats, the sugars, 
the starches, the proteins, and salts. And I wrote in the piece, I said, today, even the smell of these, even the mere awareness of their proximity, still triggers a release in humans of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which once provided our ancestors with an energy boost for the hunt, along with serotonin, the happiness hormone. So at first bite of a PB&J, our receptors um, detect the food's chemical composition and report back of all that good stuff. And then, you know, reward centers, uh, you know, they release more opiates and after a few minutes endorphins, which briefly reduce stress. So it's like an addiction. <laughs> it can be. Yeah. I mean, that's what some people that were, were talking about. You know, I think uh, there's an expert here who said um, these are the same exact same pathways that make heroin addicts uh, chase their next fix. So obviously peanut butter and jelly is not quite as potent, um, but uh, it does satisfy some very basic things within us. So the, the NBA is, is really popular, but everybody eats. And the reaction and reception to this story, I think, speaks to the power of food in that regard. But I also think it speaks to how something as simple as a peanut butter and jelly and the memory that is tied to us and the care of you know the people who make it for us. There's a lot of love in that sandwich. Well, I can identify with this because I try to recreate the food that my grandmother used to make for me, and it just never tastes as good. Even though I'm staring at a recipe card that she wrote herself, it's not the same. So absolutely, memory plays a huge role in cravings. Yeah, that that is so true. Memory plays such a strong role, and I definitely feel the same way when it comes to my grandparents' recipes. Okay, well, where does this leave us? Well, it seems like most complicated subjects, there isn't really one answer for why we crave the things we crave and why some people, like me, obsess over food more than others. So I guess we don't know, but what I do know right now is I could use another round of churros. That's Jacqueline Kim reporting for us and eating her churros from Los Angeles. Mm. The fingers. Okay. Here it goes. Mm-hmm. Proof is hosted and produced by me, Bridget Lancaster. Our executive producer is Caitlin Kelleher. Sarah Joyner is our producer. Scoring, sound design, and mixing by Matt Boynton. Editing by Caitlin Kelleher, Sarah Joyner, and Jordan Pearson. Ryan Campbell of Signal Sounds composed our theme music. And additional music by Kyle Forrester. Post-production support from Hen Margolis. Our production manager is Diane Knox. Jack Bishop is a former NBA player and the chief creative officer of America's Desk Kitchen. David Nussbaum is our CEO. Thanks again to our sponsors, Bob's Red Mill, Kohler, Chef Steps, and Escoffier. Proof is a production of America's Test Kitchen. If you're craving more, check out our website, www.americastestkitchen.com slash proof. Oh, and one more thing. If you like proof, please leave us a rating or write us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people find the show.